Thanks for listening to Other People's Flowers. If you'd like to have your work feature on the program, please send it to editor at otherpeoplesflowers.com. We hope you enjoy this episode. Alamon Grave by Daniel Richards The night watchman hears it first on the radio. A lonely harpsichordist playing a long-forgotten piece, baroque and archaic, a piece like its instrument, destined to be replaced. It has a strange effect on the night watchman. It reminds him of life before he was a night watchman, when he was a young man with hope and promise and ambition, all gone now. He sits, sipping his coffee, at the metallic desk he always sits at, in the manager's office right at the top of the factory. Outside the office, emergency lighting illuminates pockets of the factory floor. Large machines are dotted around. They are black hulks in the darkness, onyx monoliths. When the piece is over, the DJ describes it as a sublime and long-forgotten meditation on human frailty. It's a shame no one writes music like that anymore, he says. It's a shame no one wants to listen to music like that anymore. The night watchman waits for the DJ to announce the song, but he never does. After a few words, a violin concerto comes on and the pointed notes of the harpsichord are forgotten. The night watchman is frustrated. He bangs his fist on the desk. Opportunity lost. Sighing, the night watchman stands up, moves past the manager's desk he is forbidden to sit at and opens the glass-fronted door to the factory. Blackness consumes him. In the twenty years he's been a night watchman, not once has he seen the factory in the daylight. The rows of machines, the gangways, the enormous towers are all a mystery to him. Eighteen square miles of factory space. His section alone is a mile long, and he has only ever imagined it. The top half of the right wall is made entirely of glass. Through the window, the lights from the cooling towers, the enormous silver cylinders chemicals are produced in, and the long tubes and pipes that run along the outside of each of the structures make the factory look like a spaceship. The brightness is surreal. The lights are sheer white. Outside, there is only darkness. They make chemicals. He has no idea what sort. They must be important, though. With 18 square miles of space to make them, they can only be making world-critical chemicals. In his 20 years of service, he has never sought to find out anything else about the factory. He prides himself on his unquestionable adherence to the rules. And the rules are simple. No night watchman or woman must ever leave his assigned responsibility. All night watchmen or women must leave the factory before 5am to prevent interaction with the employees. Any night watchman or woman found breaking these two rules will be immediately dismissed. It has been a quiet 20 years. Adherence to the rules has ensured that. He grips the cool railing and stares down into the darkness. He stands there for a few moments more before returning to the office. A symphony is playing now. Maybe one of Beethoven's. The night watchman can't tell. They often sound the same to him. He sits back down at his table and pulls out a newspaper from under the sketches he has been doing. He skims a few pages before settling on an article about new government measures to curb unemployment. He is lucky to have a job, he thinks. Very lucky and even luckier to have this job and to spend the nights in peace rather than lying in bed and struggling with insomnia as he used to. He skims the rest of the article and turns to the crossword page. The crypto clues always interest him the most. Roundhouse, could be seen to be deadly, is a clue he will spend hours solving. He chews his pencil in deliberate pensiveness, as if life's answers will be found in soggy splinter. Slowly the night carries on, midnight, one, two, three, four, and then it is time to go home. The memory of the harpsichord is still in mind as he locks the enormous doors to his section, and begins walking down the maze of steel tunnels to the site exit. He reaches the front gate, nods to the security guard, and heads off to the side of the motorway to wait for the bus. The air is cool. A shadow of blue dawn is on the horizon. Again the night is thick. Sitting at his desk, staring out of the window, dense clouds hover above the factory, turning the white lights a faint grey, the metal an acidic black. The radio plays, a bark partita perhaps. He's not familiar with it. He decides to get up and stretch his legs. His shift has only just begun, but he has a pain in his lower back, just above the bottom vertebrae, that doesn't get any better with rubbing. Stretching. 
Rubbing his hand on the sore spot, he goes out of the office and paces along the gangway. The red emergency lights shimmer below. Each step rocks the gangway a little, and a loud clang echoes out across the silent factory floor. As he reaches the end of the gangway, he hears the sounds of the harpsichord playing the same song from the night before. He turns quickly and rushes back to the office to listen to the music. But when he reaches the door, the radio is playing advertisements, urging its listeners to buy more hair products. The sharp pings of clavier on wire sound out behind him. He turns and rushes back to the end of the gangway. The music is coming from somewhere else. But where? He stands at the very edge of the gangway, leaning out over the railings, and desperately listens out for the notes. They sing out to him like a siren in the darkness, seducing him with their false beauty. He knows he should resist, but he can't. He cannot see anything, he can only hear. The notes appear to be coming from a distant corner in the factory. Quickly, he spins around and hurries off to the other end of the gangway. When he reaches it, for the first time in 20 years of service, he goes down the winding steps to the factory floor. As he descends, he wonders why he has never gone down before. When he reaches the bottom of the spiral staircase, he remembers. The factory floor is completely black. The only lights are the near invisible emergency lights and their red glow is so weak they only illuminate tiny pockets of space in the tomb-like darkness. He turns around and places a hand on the railing, but the notes continue to sing out and he forces himself to face them again. With his hands out in front of him, he takes penguin steps towards the first red light. He moves like a ship in windless waters, barely at all, floating with the current. As he edges his way along the wall, the notes become more pronounced. He stops occasionally, standing in the pale darkness, to listen to the music and make sure he is headed in the right direction. The wall vanishes and his hand is left clutching at darkness. A narrow corridor, lit up with fading red, leads off to the left. A green and white emergency exit sign sits above a door at the end of it. Gradually, he moves to the door. On reaching it, he stops. On reaching it, he stops, places his right hand on the metal bar that runs along the door and waits. This will be the first time he has ever broken a rule. The consequences will be far-reaching. But the music keeps playing. Sharp, pointed notes keep pushing towards him. Taking a deep breath, he presses down on the bar. Without effort, the door swings open, creaking as it does, and he finds himself in the middle of another grey corridor. At the end of the dark hallway is a faint orange light, and it penetrates the darkness just enough to create a bubble of light. The harpsichord still plays. Putting his hands out in front of him once more, he steps into the corridor and moves quickly to the light. As he gets closer, he sees that the light is coming from a small office in the industrial gloom. Papers. A solitary computer, two office chairs and a long metallic table like the one in his office sit scattered about the room. The music is still playing, and as he approaches he looks for a radio, but there is none. The source of the notes is out of sight. In the room at the far corner with her back to him is a woman. She has black hair down to the shoulders. She is sitting at a harpsichord and her elbows rise and fall as she plays, pounding out the forgotten melody. The night watchman leans on the doorframe and watches her for a few moments. She is wearing the same uniform as him. He didn't know there were any night watch women. But then he has never met anyone else from the factory in his 20 years of service. As he watches her, he is unsure whether or not he should alert her to his presence. Will she say he's abandoned his post? Get him fired in the morning light? He comes off the door just as her fingers glide off the tonic or the semi-tonic. He is never sure and the piece comes to an end. Without looking up or turning round, she starts playing another piece. She plays more fiercely, striking the keys, occasionally missing a note. The piece is a fast one, and at times she slows the tempo down to make sure she gets all the right notes. He coughs against his will. A convulsive hacking series of whelps that leaves his chest heaving and the silence of the music broken. Pleurisy in his youth. Hello? Hi. Who are you? I work in the factory. I'm a night watchman. And I'm a night watchwoman. What are you doing here? I don't know, I heard the music and wanted to find its source. She is staring at him, her head slightly tilted at an angle. Her eyes are puffed up and red. She is younger than he thought. Hold on, I need my glasses, I can't see you properly without them. She gets off the piano stool and starts scanning the tabletop, running her hands along the metal. The glasses are in the middle of the table and she keeps sweeping past them with her fingers, just missing them. The night watchman takes a couple of steps forward and she stops and stares at him. 
A look of confusion clouds her face. The night watchman bends over and picks up the glasses. He outstretches his open palm to her, the glasses locked in the contours of his hand. She looks at his hand, sniffs and puts the glasses on. Now I can see you. She peers at him, drawing her eyes up and down, up and down, assessing him. You've broken the rules by coming here. I know, but you came anyway. I came to hear the music, as you have already said. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry, it's you who will lose your job after all. The night watchman is silenced by her words. It is he who will lose his job, and after so many years he is not so sure what he could possibly do other than be a night watchman. The light swings in its socket, rocking from side to side. Will you play something for me? I don't perform for audiences. I brought my harpsichord here so I could play without people listening, but clearly that was wishful thinking. Do they let you have the harpsichord here? It would seem that way. The night watchman shuffles on his feet. Can I ask you what you were playing? All of it? Just the first piece. It was Alamon Graf by Couperin. You know it? Not really. They stand in silence. The woman continues to stare at him. Her gaze is haunting, almost accusatory. He winces under it, but there is no getting out of it. How long have you played for? As long as I can remember. May I look at the instrument? You may do as you wish. He walks round the table, the barrier between them, towards the harpsichord. As he does so, he brushes her shoulder. Did she lean towards him so that they might touch each other? Or was it his imagination? It was his imagination. They are both professionals, and they have only just met. They have an important job to do, far more important than petty shoulder brushing. The lacquer shines off the brown wood. The light is a dull white dot on the wood, diminished by the sheen and the polish. The night watchman stretches his fingers out over the keys, turning them into fans. He hovers over the keys for a few seconds, then closes his fingers into fists and turns away. For a second I thought you were going to play, says the night watchwoman. I don't know how. It's never too late to learn. I think... I think it would be for me. Nothing is difficult if you put your mind to it. The night watchman wonders what would be appropriate to say. The woman returns to the heart's accord and sits down on the stool. She flicks her hair from right to left and looks as if she is about to play. But she doesn't. She sits and stares at the keys, and for a moment all of her hopes and fear and broken dreams and empty relationships come back to haunt her, to tell her that she can play the heart's accord as much as she likes, but those memories will never go away. The night watchman stands watching her. The silence haunts him. Then softly, barely audible, her fingers touch the keys. The music is just audible. It is as if she is not touching the keys at all, as if some ghost or some spirit is moving her keys, making her play. He stares at her. Her head hangs towards the piano keys. She is lost to the music. She plays for ten minutes, then stops and turns to him. Rama, she says. I like it. You can go back to your sector now. If you stay any longer, I'll be forced to tell the managers and you'll lose your job. Can I... Can I come again? If you must. Tomorrow, tomorrow night? If you must. With that, their brief time together is over, and the night watchman wonders if perhaps it was all just a dream. He shuffles back down the dark corridors, running his right hand along the wall to keep balance, and then he is back in the enormous empty factory floor. The monolithic mechanical beast blocks in the darkness. The red lights dull beacons. He goes back up the spiral staircase. Dawn is breaking off in the distance. A wavelet of cloud twists over the sunlight. The factory is black, its lights fading, pale in the daybreak. It is already 5am. He must hurry or he'll be late to leave. He spends the day lying in bed, trying to remember the way the woman's hair curled round the nape of her neck, but the image is a phantom that he chases around as light pushes its way through his broken blinds. He hears his cleaner coming and going. She drops some pans on the floor and the loud clang of metal on tile makes his heart race. It is a pleasure to go to work. It rains on his way there. Grey clouds sweep over the night sky, blotting out the moon and the stars. Droplets glide down the windows on the bus. He is the only passenger. The others are still asleep. The factory shines in the rain, the lights are brighter, the metal tubes and towers gleam and glisten. Colourless droplets clatter against the tarmac. 
backsplashes bouncing off the black concrete. The security guard at the gate does not even look up when he presents his pass. Puddles are dotted about the tarmac and it is a challenge to leap or sidestep them. He sits sodden in his office waiting for the music to begin. Hours pass, the rain breaks and the stars twinkle through the dark sky. At 2am, after enduring the silence for too long, he decides to go to the night watchwoman's sector and find out if she is there. Rain starts again as he is descending the spiral staircase. Winds shake the windows and they rattle and whistle in the downpour. Steel raindrops clatter down from above, a deafening drone on the roof. Defiant, he makes his way past the black machines, turns left down the poorly lit corridor, and to the double doors that lead to the night watch woman's sector. When he gets there, he expects to hear music. The silence can only have been brought about by the rain. The woman is playing, but the notes have been silenced. That is all. As he reaches the office, it is clear that there is no music. The light is on. He approaches and stands at the entrance. The woman is sitting on the table in the middle. She has her head in her hands. Her fingers are spread out across her skull, and she is slowly massaging her skull. The harpsichord sits with its lid closed in the far corner. Somehow, when it is not being used, it looks smaller and more compact. The night watchman coughs, but she doesn't turn around. I knew you were here. I heard you coming. You are hardly a mouse. You're not playing today. No, I'm not. The night watchman waits for an explanation, but none comes, and he stands and waits and half expects something to happen, but nothing does. Why aren't you playing? Because today is the 15th of March, and I never play on the 15th of March. The night watchman lost track of dates and months a long time ago. When you work every day, somehow the weekends, the summer and the winter become irrelevant. The only indication he ever needs of the time of year is the weather. Summer can come in July or it can come in October. It makes no difference. Why did you come back? Because I couldn't hear the music and I wanted to. You didn't think that maybe the rain was drowning out the noise? I did, but I thought I could hear you if I came closer. Why are you so intent on hearing me play? It is a question with no answer. Why is he so willing to throw away 20 years of service to come and listen to this woman he doesn't know play the harpsichord? It is not even a piano, and yet somehow he is drawn to the instrument, to the sound as if all the years of loneliness have vanished through a single note. You may as well sit down. There's some coffee in the thermos. You won't mind if I let you help yourself. Cautiously, like a child breaking a rule for the first time, he moves round the side of the desk and sits opposite the woman. She doesn't look up. The chair scrapes across the floor as he moves it, and the woman lets out a long sigh. Subtlety certainly isn't your strong suit. No, it is not. He has few strong suits. He slides the thermos across the table and pours himself a cup of coffee. It is bittersweet, but the caffeine has a calming effect on him. On the first sip, he begins to relax. Tell me about yourself. He is hesitant. The woman looks up and stares at him with her blue eyes, questioning him. I was born in 1961 in... But the woman interrupts him. I'm not interested in when or where you were born. I don't care what you've done with your life. I already know the answer to that. I want to know about you, the real you. What are your hopes and fears? What do you think about during the long and lonely nights we must spend here? The night watchman sips his coffee. I... Think about what I'm going to eat for my next meal. I'm worried that I might not be able to get to sleep when I get home. Is that it? For the most part. And what are you afraid of? I'm afraid... I'm afraid no one will remember me. Why would anyone remember you? I don't know. To be remembered, you have to have done something, good or bad, so what have you done? Nothing, I've done nothing. The woman pauses her interrogation and pours herself another cup of coffee. Silence ensues. And what about you? Me? Yes, you. I answered your questions, now you should answer mine. The woman stirs her lukewarm coffee with a finger. She licks her finger and rubs it dry on the sleeve of her uniform. I am afraid of not being able to play the harpsichord. Of one day forgetting my own name. All I think about is how I can delay the inevitable. Soon, I know, my fingers will become unresponsive, the notes will blur in my mind, and the years I spent learning those pieces will have been a waste. Do you have dementia? Alzheimer's, to be exact. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. 
but you're young. Not so young as you think. The woman runs her hand through her hair and wraps it into a ponytail. Effortlessly, she pulls a hairband from her wrist and takes her hair into a bun. Lines of wrinkles show from the top of her hairline down to the nape of her neck. She looks at him intensely. Do you have a family? I used to. What happened? My wife left many years ago. We were only married for a year and a half. We made a mistake. Yes, yes, we did. And you? Who will look after you when you've forgotten your own name? I don't need anyone to look after me. The woman stands and walks over to the harpsichord. She stares at the wood, runs her hand over the top of the lacquer and turns back to face the night watchman. The night is over. You should get back to your sector. I don't want you to lose your job. Within a month of her moving in with him, he begins to notice the onset of the disease. Simple things at first. The first time he catches her staring at the cutlery drawer, the dull knives and the forks looking up at her. She rocks gently back and forth on her heels, her eyes are blank, and she stares like that for perhaps 30 seconds before remembering herself and taking a spoon from the drawer. When she sees him watching her, she smiles innocently. She plays the harpsichord as much as she can. On their rare days off, he sits in his grey-walled living room on a brown sofa he bought in a flea market in a small medieval town and watches her hands roll up and down the keyboard. You're watching me. I like to watch you. It's off-putting. Can't you find something else to do? I could, but I don't want to. She smiles at this and turns back to the keyboard. The rising dawn sends wedges of light through the window. The sky turns from black to dark blue to pale blue, the sun slanting off the rooftops. It is nearly time for them to go to bed. Sleeping next to her, the night watchman feels safe. She'll lie down next to him. Their bodies won't touch. She'll offer a smile and he'll grin back at her. And then he'll turn his bedside light off and they'll lie in the darkness, still like tombstones. Threads of light will push through the blinds, narrow slits. As the day draws on, they'll slowly grow closer together, until she is touching him, and he her, and they'll spend the rest of the day sleeping in each other's arms. You're staring at me again. She has turned from her harpsichord and is watching him. Her eyes have grown paler blue since she moved in, as if the disease is sapping her strength and with it her iris tone. She turns away and stares out of the window. A raven lands on the rusted iron railing of the balcony. It glares at the night watchwoman, its eyes as black as lava rock. It brushes its wings with its beak and flies off. She stops working after six months. At times she forgets her name. All that is important is in memories. All that matters, and hers are slowly fading. At other times she cannot remember how to use a knife and fork. He helps her. He tells her her name, cuts her food up for her, listens to her shout at him in frustration. The heart's accord remains, though, somehow, on days when it seems like she is facing up to the darkness of forgetfulness alone, she'll sit down at the keys and her fingers will come alive. Without hesitating, she'll play a piece, and for a moment the disease is gone. Memory has returned and she is whole again. The time comes when she cannot be alone anymore. A nurse comes to look after her during the nights when he is at work. Their patterns change. She sleeps during the night and he during the day. They see each other awake for maybe two or three hours of the day. She is already a phantom in his flat. Every day when he comes back from work, strolling down the boulevard, silent in the dawn, birds chirping, the hope of the day seizing the slumbering city, he prays and hopes that she'll still remember who he is. On the landing, he can hear her shouting at the nurse. Who are you? What are you doing here? This is my house. Get out. He enters and the nurse looks at him, panics. And who are you? The nurse gathers her belongings, offers him a muted smile and goes out the door. It slams shut. That woman is insane. I can't have her in the house anymore. You're late back from school. I told you not to spend any more time with those older girls. They'll corrupt you. I haven't been at school. So where have you been, skiving? If I get another call from the principal, you can go and live with your father. He sits down and stares at her. She forgets him and frantically bites her nails. Then she sits at the harpsichord and tries to play something. She plays a couple of bars and the music falls apart. She starts again, but doesn't make it to the end of bar three. She tries again and again, but each time her fingers fail her and she forgets the keys. Leaving her in peace, he prepares for bed. 
He crawls under the covers and listens to her try to play the piece, but she keeps failing. Eventually, he hears her sobs. The bedroom door opens and she slips next to him under the covers. Her eyes are red raw, her hair silvery. She looks at him through a film of tears. You know, I don't think anyone ever loved me before I met you. Thank you. Thank you. She nestles close to him. He puts his arm around her. And in the evening, when he gets up for work, she is cold and still. Other People's Flowers was produced by Hugo Gibson, Chris Kamon Vuchitam, and Hamish Adam Kans. If you'd like to have your work featured on the show, please send it to editor at otherpeoplesflowers.com. Thank you for listening.